to another wonderful citizen sciences program presentation. Uh, once again, we have to be so, so grateful to the foundation for their generosity and everything they do for this community. Any of you that don't know, my name is Ramya. I am the Director of Environmental Science at the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Uh, we have uh, lectures like this uh, the third Thursday of every month. Um, it only changes a little bit when there's holidays and things like that that get in the way, but usually the third Thursday of every month. Um, we try to bring in uh, as many guest speakers as we can. We try to keep it, you know, light, entertaining, educational, and uh, you know, keep it as you know, as many different topics as we can cover uh, that are relevant, obviously, to Key Biscayne in South Florida. Uh, today, we have with us Colin Ford, who is the co-founder of Coral Morphologic. Um, for those of you that were here a little earlier and you saw the, the live fish swimming around on the screen, that was from the Coral City camera, which is a live feed camera um, off of Port Miami, and he'll tell you more about that. And it's really cool, it's accessible on YouTube, and you can watch it anytime, and like I said, it's a live feed, so you see some really interesting things on there. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Ford. I mean, sorry, Colin. Thank you for having me here today. Very pleased to be here and tell you more about this project uh, that's very dear to my heart. So the Coral City camera is now four years old. Um, it has been deployed at the Port of Miami uh, and it has greatly exceeded all of my expectations uh, as someone who's an optimist of environmental and underwater uh, science, uh, despite sort of some of the, the real declines that we've observed uh, over the summer, and I'll get more into that, but the Coral City camera has been a real bright spot, uh, and we've learned so much uh, from watching it, and it's really become sort of this community, um, I like to describe it as sort of a, it's a digital campfire that everybody can kind of gather around, uh, and we have a really wonderful community of people that you can join on YouTube uh, to collectively watch these fish right here in our own backyard 24-7 uh, anywhere in the world. So um, we call it the Coral City Camera because, um, so I'm co-founder of, of Coral Morphologic. It's a, it's a hybrid art and science endeavor. Um, and the, the idea of the Coral City really, in my mind, it explains what Miami is. Miami is a city that is on a coral reef. It's the third largest coral reef in the world. Um, and many of the buildings here are actually built out of coral limestone um, and so, of course, Coral Gables is named for the type of keystone that we see. Um, and you can see that the corals are literally right on our doorstep here. So what is Coral Morphologic? Well, we're a Miami-based multimedia effort inducing human coral symbiosis through science, technology, and art in an attempt to catalyze a collective paradigm shift in our understanding of life on Earth and awareness of the micro and macro cosmos. So real, we, we have real small, you know, we, 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 we're not thinking too big here. Um, and this is uh, my partner, J.D. McKay, and myself in our lab that we have in Alapata. Uh, we are entering our 16th year here in Miami, so we've been, to, we've been at this for a very long time. Um, and a lot of what we do in the lab is really just um, documenting corals and showcasing them to people so that they understand just how beautiful they are and if you can sort of attract people in with the, with the beauty of the corals then people perhaps want to learn more about them and, and why they're so important and what we need to do to protect them. Um, and so these are some of the photography that, that we do. Um, but we're trying to bring corals into all aspects of, of life. So, you know, we use art, we use music, um, and we're using fashion. This is a collection that we did with a, a company called Volcom a few years ago that features corals and native corals here to Miami, um, as well as this, what I call the brainstone print, which um, is in the keystone that you see here in Miami. And more recently, we did uh, a runway show this past uh, Miami Swim Week uh, with, uh, with these bathing suits that were all made out of sustainable uh, cotton and hemp, um, so there's no microplastics, and every purchase of one of these bathing suits actually plants a coral back into the, into the ocean. So it, we're really uh, trying to, to bring corals into places that they haven't really uh, been before outside of the world of science. 
And so, you know, here in Miami, coral is our past and it's our present and it's our future. Um, and of course, you know, this keystone is called Keystone because it was quarried out of the Florida Keys. And the Florida Keys, as islands, uh, at one time were the coral reefs. So when the water level was much higher, um, you know, the corals are building these skeletons and they leave behind a calcium carbonate uh, skeleton. And you can actually see species of corals, um, like these brain corals here, that have been, were quarried and utilized in the, in the architecture uh, that is really iconographic of our city and, of course, Coral Gables. Um, this is a, a project that we did during last Art Basel, during Art Week, where we projection mapped corals onto the Arsht Center. Um, it was one of the largest projection mapping projects that's ever been done in the United States. Um, and, you know, we sort of took the, the architecture of this building, which to me sort of represented a, a, a brain coral head um, and thinking about the future of, of this city in, in being vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, and basically the buildings that are made out of this concrete and limestone that was recycled from what was originally built by corals uh, many thousands and millions of years ago, we now build these, these, these structures that are in a lot of ways very similar to a coral reef. Corals are sort of the original real estate developers of planet Earth. Um, they create the, the housing that attracts the fish, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why coral reefs are so biodiverse, is because the corals sort of create uh, a lot of apartments for other animals to be able to, to, to live in them. And so healthy coral reefs are um, really important to, to the whole community. So corals are community builders. And here is a, um, an installation that was a commission through Miami-Dade Art and Public Places. Um, this is the new Virgin Voyages terminal at the Port of Miami. So when people leave the terminal to get on the boats, they are passing through uh, these, this, what we call the threshold, uh, where they're sort of entering onto the ship, uh, leaving through these coral gates. Um, but we also... Um, are sort of helping, we're, we're working on the scientific front as well. And this is a coral laboratory that, uh, that I helped build uh, in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. And this is the president of the UN General Assembly showing him this, uh, th this coral lab that we built uh, because corals here in Florida and throughout the Caribbean and around the world uh, need our help. And coral restoration is, is one of the ways that we can help uh, bring back the coral reefs by building these labs and growing corals on shore. But uh, I think now is a good time to kind of take a step back and remember where we are, because of course we're in such a really special place here um, in Miami and Key Biscayne. Uh, but it's important to kind of see the bigger picture. And you know, here we have our planet, and we have our one moon, and the moon is really special because this is what provides us with uh, the tides, uh, a lot of the tides, which of course then creates the conditions uh, for for life to, to really take hold, it creates our weather, um, and, and it adds just, a, just enough chaos to the system to make life uh, as vibrant as possible. So it's kind of, the, the moon is kind of like the, the minute hand, if we're, we live on a cosmic clock, uh, where you know, the Earth rotates once every 24 hours, and the moon revolves around our Earth every 29 and a half days, and then the moon and the Earth revolve around the sun every 365 days. So it's, we, we are sort of living on a clock, and corals know this because corals are cemented in place, and the only way that they can reproduce with each other is if they're all synchronized to the exact same time. So corals, not only are they the first real estate developers and community builders of planet Earth, they're also the first astronomers and they're the first timekeepers of planet Earth. So when corals reproduce, they're basically they're paying attention to the full moon. This is their, this is their key to know that you know, at the exact same minute, the exact same time, all of the corals on a coral reef will release their gametes into the water, um, which enables them to, to spawn with each other. Um, and this is all because basically we're living on a, on a clock that has one moon, and having two moons would be a little too chaotic, and no moons would be a problem. We wouldn't have tides or weather. So now we can zoom down to our lovely peninsula, the Floridian Peninsula. And of course, we like to think that we live in the tropics, but we're in the subtropics, but we get a tropical climate with the help of our Gulf Stream current, which is you know, located a few miles offshore Miami. And that's what brings the warm water and a lot of the coral reef fishes and, and, uh, and coral larvae with it. 
And you know, here we are looking at, at Miami. We have two inlets in, into, the, into North Biscayne Bay that have been artificially created. Um, and of course, this has been really helpful to help flush uh, this bay and helps keep the water clean without having these inlets. Um, it would be, maybe we would probably have a lot more fish kills. So um, while there are pros and cons of having these, these, uh, these inlets, it's important for a city to have a port. Um, and without a port, Miami would, would really have struggled as a, as a city. So this is really our lifeline, but it also sort of serves as a way to, to bring in this marine life from offshore. So now we're looking sort of at government cut inlet, um, and every incoming tide is bringing ocean water from offshore. And with that, fish and coral larvae that are able to uh, colonize the, the infrastructure that we've built. Of course, um, you know, the, this is a look at Fisher Island, uh, and you can see there is no port of Miami uh, 100 years ago. So the, the, the port of Miami is, is really entirely uh, dredged up out of the bay itself. Of course, a lot of the iconic islands like uh, Star Island, Hibiscus Island, uh, the Venetian Islands, they are also uh, dredged up out of the bay. But in order to sort of protect that infrastructure, you need seawalls uh, to make sure that the ocean doesn't just erode that uh, property back into the water. So it is those seawalls that have basically provided um, the habitat for corals to to live on because there's really not a lot of rocky shoreline. You know, mostly uh, we have mangroves here, um, but the addition of this of this concrete and uh, limestone riprap as sort of protection uh, for the erosion provides a really amazing habitat for uh, corals and marine life to, to colonize. So we've sort of inadvertently created uh, a really amazing urban coral reef environment. And this is where the Coral City camera is. So this is, we're looking at the pilot station, um, right at the, at the very east end of Port of Miami. The pilots are the ones that actually uh, drive the, all of the ships. The cruise ships uh, go, the cruise ships go this direction and the cargo goes this direction. Um, and so, and all of the, this, these rocks here were only placed there in 2010. And this is what has, what has created the, the structure for this Coral City Camera urban reef. So this is the Coral City Camera itself. Um, basically, it lives inside this glass dome. We're able to rotate it 360 degrees so we can change the perspective throughout the course of the day. But we see a lot of really amazing things. I was going to show you what we just saw this past week of a um, mama manatee and a baby manatee. And then we see, we see lemon sharks all the time. Um, and so, of course, you're going to have to watch the Coral City camera in order to see those things, because uh, I can't, yes, exactly. It is a manatees. Um, <laughs> but, we, but another really powerful thing that we've been able to do with the Coral City camera, because these are time lapses. That we've, these are the, the world's first time lapses of corals bleak. Did it almost play? I'm constantly thinking about the Coral City camera, which means that right now I need to be rotating it which I will do because people are probably wondering why, why the camera hasn't been moved. But this is, uh, what you're looking at right here is a brain coral that is actually growing at the, um, the intertidal zone. Uh, yeah, so, so we're looking at some of those boulders um, that, that you could see from basically, I just rotated the camera right now on my phone and this is, this is our wiper. This is what keeps the algae from growing on the glass and we got a little bit of a delay, I just had to move it. And now we're looking um, west towards downtown. So you can see there's a kind of a slope of these boulders, and those are the boulders that were put there in um, 2010. So all of the corals that have recruited there have really done that just in the last decade, which is also quite impressive. And yeah, and literally at any point in time, we could get a manatee that's going to swim towards us, uh, where we could see we could. We could see all kinds of, um, I mean, we've seen over 200 different species of fish. Uh, we see seabirds, we see manatees, uh, sea turtles. Um, I mean, so we occasionally see snorkelers and we generally don't like seeing snorkelers because they often have spear, they often have spear guns. Um, but we rarely, this is one of the reasons why we chose the Port of Miami uh, because it is a very, it's a difficult place to, to 
anchor your boat and it's not really encouraged to, to be there. We can't really keep people from being there, but um, it isn't a difficult lo location for people to mess with the camera. So we rarely see people, which is nice. And one of the things that I really love about the camera is notice how the fish are swimming towards us. You know, if you've ever watched an underwater film, um, you know, there's a person behind the camera and the fish are always trying to swim away from the camera. So to be able to sort of have a, a spy camera underwater, we can observe these animals without any sort of human influence, which I think is, um, you know, opens up, it makes it a, a great tool, not just for education, uh, but also scientific research to observe, um, you know, it's sort of like having a, a little stationary submarine or an underwater observatory uh, right here in our, own, in our own backyard. It's a little quiet on the camera right now. And uh, so I'll go back to, yeah, thanks, Andrew. How far down? So we're, it's about eight feet deep. Um, so it's, so it's, not, it's not too deep. Um, you know, I, I, I get there, uh, walk in the water. Um, it's about 20 feet from the edge of the shoreline um, and in about eight feet of water. So it's right at the, right at the base of, of the, the rocks that, they, you know, the camera's right about there. So these are these boulders that you see. Um, and you can see they extend all the way up. And this is really designed to protect the, the port from a big uh, storm surge or, or hurricane. So that's the primary purpose of these, of these boulders here is really just to protect the shoreline. But inadvertently, it has created this really amazing, what we call an urban coral reef. OK, and we are doing, we're actively doing scientific research here. Uh, we work with NOAA. Uh, of course, located right here nearby in Virginia Key. Because, of course, you know, you've probably read the news that corals, and there's been a lot of bleaching, there's been a lot of disease. Corals in South Florida in general are not, are not doing very well, and yet the corals around the Port of Miami uh, seem to be more resistant to bleaching and more resistant to disease. And it really, when you think about, you know, when a coral settles as a larvae, it has one chance to find the right home. Because once it's cemented in place, it can't, it can't swim away, it can't move. Um, so the corals that grow into adults in these habitats are clearly very, very strong. And they're very resilient. Cool. Is Why do you this? think they're not bleaching out? Well, they, it appears that they have different types of... Um, here's, our, here's, our man, here's our manatee. Yeah. So we love, we love seeing the big chubby baby manatees. Um, and so you know, this was just, uh, this was just ten, uh, a week ago that we, saw, that we saw them. We typically see a handful of manatees. Um, this should work. OK, great. Cool. What's the manatee doing here? What's it eating? Well, so the, you know, the, the manatees are, 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 are coming in and out of the bay. They eat the seagrass. Uh, they also probably go up the canals where they're able to eat um, Freshwater plants. Uh, I know, you know, on the University of Miami campus, we would see. Uh, yeah, you can hit that. I think we've watched this one before, but it's, we can. So we see. It's remarkable how many lemon sharks we see here. And remarkably, when I go there, I don't see the lemon sharks. So <laughs> what I think that means is that the lemon sharks know that I'm in the water, and they avoid me, which tells us that that's a good thing. That you know, that they don't want to. They don't want to bother humans. Um, and lemon sharks are really cool. They actually they return to where they give birth. And we have a population of female lemon sharks that I think are, are pupping in the Bill Sadowski Critical Wildlife Area, which is on the backside of Virginia Key, um, where there's a lot of seagrass and a lot of mangroves. And it's a great little nursery ground for, for small uh, for baby sharks. And I think even all of the Key Biscayne itself serves as sort of a nursery for, for small sharks. Yeah, you can hit play on this one. So this is... Um, these, this is what you're seeing here is really one of the world's first time lapses of coral growth, bleaching, and, and die off. Um, and these were corals that were brought by the University of Miami from their offshore coral nursery, transplanted to this site. Um, and so this, these corals were not born in this habitat. They were you know, born offshore and brought in as a part of a scientific study. And you can see that they really are not, they couldn't handle the heat this summer. But you can see them growing, and then you see them bleaching, and then you see them die, and now you see them eroding away. And this is, you know, a, it's, it's, 
it's sad to see, but you know these are corals that are that are cultivated uh, in a nursery, so they're just clones. Um, they still exist offshore in the nursery, but it but it is very eye opening. I think you can go to the next next one. And, um, yeah, the hot water really, I mean, we had water temperatures in excess of 90 degrees here. So you can see, this is them growing, it starts in May 1st, and you can see by, the, by July, uh, it, everything turned white, died. And, and if you watch this coral, this brain coral, which is native here, it lasts a lot longer, then it bleaches, and now as of uh, yesterday, it starts on May 1st. And it and it goes until yesterday. It's about one month a second, one month a second, starting in May. Yep. So it's so this is uh, yeah thirty frames per second. So you know every every day is a is a third of uh, and you can kind of see down here. Well, you can see that this brain coral here has recovered from bleaching. So you know the the, the staghorn corals didn't make it, and these corals are not native to the port, whereas these corals survived bleaching um, and, have, and, and recovered, whereas some, some corals never bleached at all, um, these, native, these native corals. But this is a coral that has, that has recovered, so that's a good sign. This one, this is a very eye-opening time lapse because this is one of the corals from the offshore University of Miami nursery. So, you know, I mean, we see a big difference between high tide and low tide. Um, you know, the cameras are really good reference for divers and for fishermen to, to see what the conditions are in the water. Um, you know, during low tide, we, we get more turbidity. Um, offshore, if it's calm, then we get nice clear water that comes in, but if it's really uh, there's a lot of storms or there's a lot of uh, waves offshore that mucks things up and we, we can have low visibility. So, you know, it's like in life you have high tides and low tides and you've got sunny days and cloudy days and, you know, and you learn to appreciate on the days in the camera when it's murky that you can appreciate the, the nice clean, the nice clean uh, sunshiny days. This, this staghorn coral right here, this is a staghorn coral that's native to Fisher Island. It's self-recruited. Can you hit that? And it didn't bleach, and it kept growing, whereas this coral down here is from offshore. This is a staghorn coral. It's growing, it bleaches, it dies. And this one up here just grows. So these, you know, these corals, um, this is a really great way for, for us to find really resilient types of corals that we can then amplify or we can breed for future coral restoration. You know, it's like a, this is like a gauntlet for these corals. And if they can survive here, the chances are they can survive elsewhere in Florida. That's right. Because this is a tough environment for, for a coral. You know, living halfway out of the water and exposed uh, at low tide. Um, and so we've been able to publish, um, we've been able to, to publish uh, reports about the resilience of these corals uh, with NOAA. And now we're really getting into sort of the, the genetics and, and um, the microbiome that's living with these corals that is, is sort of serving as their immune system and, and allowing them to, um, to survive and, and how they're different from the same species that are living offshore that are not nearly as, as resilient. So just show, this is a different perspective. I filmed this with, with my GoPro, you know, so we're looking down, downtown um, and here's, this is what the Coral City camera looks like underwater. You can see it's on some concrete blocks. And this is what we call the stadium. This is the, the um, these riprap boulders. Um, this is a hydrophone that we had installed for a week in June to record the sound since the Coral City camera doesn't record the sound. These, this was before the bleaching event and these were all the corals that had been transplanted by the University of Miami program that sadly all died. Um, but this is, you know, you can see we're Right in, right in the middle of, of things. And this is our little urban coral nursery that is in collaboration with, with NOAA. And these are, the, these are the, the native staghorn and elkhorn corals that didn't bleach, uh, which is really remarkable and gives, gives us some hope, um, given that they suffered extreme losses in a lot of the nurseries offshore and down in the Keys, the Coral Restoration Foundation. And these, uh, these corals, this is elkhorn coral, which is one of the rarest types of corals that we have in Florida. 
and you know they're th they're thriving in this environment that I don't think you'd ever expect any coral biologist to ever expect to find them. Um, and so at nighttime, um, these corals are fluorescent, um, and so I, I went uh, with underwater and I filmed I filmed these corals with with blue LED lights, and this is. You know, I mean, corals are sort of the aliens that are living living amongst us. They've been here for for millions of years, and you know, they look. For me, at my aha moment, when I was five years old, and I had the privilege to go snorkeling for the first time in Mexico, and I saw brain corals, and it was kind of like they look like brains, and they're alive, and they're rocks. You know, that to me was enough. This was what I was interested, uh, you know, in, in in wanting to study for the rest of my life. And so, you know, the brain coral to me represents, um, you know, there's something really special and deep about uh, these corals. It's something to contemplate. Um, it's almost as if the corals are trying to tell us something. Um, and and this is really the approach that we take through coral morphologic, rather than mm -hmm. thinking that you know corals are 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 weak and are are too delicate for modern life. Uh, we sort of take it the other way and that we have something to learn from them. They've been on the planet for half a billion years. They've been building cities a lot longer than we have. You know, maybe we should sort of take some of that and 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 learn how to live more harmoniously in our own cities, in our own in, in our own communities. And and this is I think a different a very different approach. Um, you know, that we have something to learn from them as opposed to the other way around. Um, and this is, you know, these are our native corals. These, these are the corals that uh, are living right on our own backyard and our own, our own doorstep. They live around Key Biscayne as well. There's populations of these brain corals that are living um, at Bill Baggs Park along the seawalls. Um, there's, there's brain corals that live along the seawall at the Miami Sea Aquarium. Um, and so, you know, these are really, really tenacious corals. And there's, I think that, that we've documented 20, 22 species of, of corals uh, living at the mm -hmm. port, and there's only 48 species of stony corals in Florida. So we've almost have half, half of all of the species of corals that you find in Florida have self-recruited to the port of Miami all entirely on their own. And, um, and, and we sort of think that these could be some of the most scientifically valuable corals on the planet uh, because they're really living in a place that you would never Never imagine or never expect them um, to be doing so well. Now, what colors are they in the daytime? You say this is night. Yeah. So during you know during the daytime you know they they tend to be more gray and earth toned, uh, but the, you do see uh, greens. Uh, the fluorescent green shows up shows up the most. Um, I think you know during the daytime this coral is going to kind of look more khaki colored, um, kind of a gray. The pinks don't show up quite as much during the daytime, um, but uh, you know, green, brown, gray uh, tends to be the, the, the standard colors uh, during the daytime, and that's really because the, the sun, most of the, the, you know, the light that we're seeing is in the white spectrum in shallow water, but as you go down in the ocean, you, fil you begin to filter out all of the reds and then the oranges and the yellows and the greens, and you're only left with the blue wavelengths. And so the blue wavelengths really are kind of act like the black light that causes the, the proteins in these corals to fluoresce. And, and scientists think that it is these fluorescent proteins that are kind of acting like a sunscreen to these corals. Because again, you know, coral is, is sunbathing all of the time, and it needs to put on sunscreen too. And it makes its own sunscreen by becoming fluorescent, uh, by taking these really powerful uh, wavelengths and, and sort of turning them into less powerful uh, wavelengths of light, like orange colors and green colors, um, you know, using the blue the blue spectrum. Um, but these are this this was all filmed uh, right around the Coral City camera. Uh, when I filmed it, I I didn't realize that there was a cruise ship that was that was leaving, and and it's I highly advise not swimming. Uh, when the cruise ships are leaving the port because they create a tremendous amount of current uh, that, is, that is very, very strong. And so again, all these, these animals are living, living with all of these extremes. It's like a, it's like a hurricane, um, the, the, the power of the water that these ships displace. And yet, you know, it has created a, an inadvertent little paradise for these, for these animals uh, that is really um, very unique. And I'll just 
played a couple of these out. This was, this was a little PSA that we made for Oolite Arts. Um, and I want to point out that we don't see a huge amount of trash, but we do, when we do see the trash, the people that watch the Coral City camera react very uh, personally, like this is, this is really, um, you know, uh, as, as people watch the Coral City camera, it becomes like a home to them. And when they see this type of, you know, pollution, it, it, it sort of feels like it's their own backyard that's being polluted. And people, I think, feel a lot more motivated uh, to, to think about, you know, where the water and the trash, where it, where it drains. Um, and because, you know, everything down here winds up in the ocean eventually. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is the, our goal really is to try and, and get the Coral City camera in as many of the uh, public schools here in Miami-Dade County because it's really one of the best tools to get kids uh, engaged with the, with the nature. I'm just going to let this run out while I talk and I can take, I can take questions too because I'm more or less uh, at the end. But, you know, I, as a tool for engaging the community with, you know, really what makes Miami so special, which is our, you know, blue water, um, you know, the clean air. This is what people come here for. Um, and without it, we, as a community, have, have a lot to lose. And that includes our real estate values. And that clean, clean water and healthy biodiverse um, waterways in Miami actually is, is only going to improve our property values uh, because this is what people, people want. They don't want, you know, stinking fish kills and algae filled waterways. Um, and so to be able to show kids that in their classroom, which is sort of like putting them, you know, in the, like the yellow submarine and the magic school bus combined into one, into one uh, really amazing portal for, for the kids to, to see what makes their, um, their home so special because a lot of kids don't have access to boats and they don't have access, uh, you know, you can't take a classroom of kids scuba diving. Um, but, you know, you, you can put a, a YouTube video up on the screen and we hear so much from teachers about how, you know, the kids, they just, they, they get so absorbed into it. Um, and sometimes, you know, they're, they're acting up and the, the teacher will have the kids watch the Coral City camera and they calm down and they get their focus. And it's, it's really the benefits that exceed just sort of learning about nature, but there's, you know, there's a, I think an element of watching fish that is soothing and calming and, and provides um, you know something that is you know nature nature is good for the soul and I think that that's really what what the the coral city camera shows and so what I'm showing you here now is starting at the bottom of the channel so about 45 feet deep in the shipping channel at the port of Miami and sort of climbing scuba diving all the way up um, over this this ledge here and then eventually we're going to come up to the to the Boulder Rip Rap. Um, where the Coral City camera is, but just want to show you that this is, you know, this is all artificial, but yet has been completely colonized by sponges and soft corals and um, and all of this, all of this marine life um, is really, really special. So, exactly. So, if, I, if there's any questions, all right. Yes. No, yeah, I'm, sure. So, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this coming in the water over here, I keep hearing, I'm a native, I've lived here my whole life, but there's never been a shark, and I know baby sharks, but they have been too. I know leather sharks. Mm -hmm. um, can we feel okay going in the water, or what do we have to do? Like, don't wear gold, and don't go with that. Can you give us like everything? Yeah, so the, the lemon sharks are, are a very mellow shark species. Um, and so they, they really, um, and as I was saying, when I get in the water, I don't see them. They, they are swimming away from me. Um, we do tend to see them more in the mornings and, and, and in the evenings, not so much during the middle of the day. Um, yeah, we have beautiful angelfish here at the, uh, at the site that you can watch all the time. Um, and so lemon sharks is mostly what we see. We see nurse sharks. They're also very, very gentle, not very, not aggressive at all. Um, and we, and we rarely see the bull sharks, which is the only species of shark that, you know, as a diver, I have a healthy amount of respect for. Um, but they tend to really be in more murky water. So, you know, if the water is clear, 
the sharks, you know, then, then that, the reason why it's maybe dangerous to be in murky water is just because the shark has to get close to you or they don't, they, they don't recognize you. And they're not, they're not hunting for humans, you know, th those shark bites often happen because they have low visibility. Um, so it's not really something that we need to worry about at, at our beaches. Because um, sharks really, they're, you know, they, they have their, their preferred prey that they're following uh, of fish and, and, and humans aren't really on, on that. Uh, you know, I think about it a lot because we see so many manatees and you think, well, you know, why wouldn't a shark, you know, the manatee is just a soft, big soft, uh, you know, potato. potato. Why wouldn't sharks uh, go after them? And, and they clearly they don't. Um, and so that gives me um, a fair amount of confidence that, that exactly. sharks are not really interested in humans because humans are a lot more bony than a manatee. I mean, this is true. When, when you ha when, if you're spear fishing or if you're lobstering where you have something that they can smell that they want, you know, if you've killed a fish uh, and you're swimming with a, with, you know, a hogfish that you just speared, that's a different story. Um, so, you know, it's all in kind of what you're doing also. And, and being mindful of, of where you are and understanding, of course, when you're, when you're in the ocean, you're in their world um, and you just have to kind of be aware of that. But at the beach, if you're casually in the water, you don't have to worry about sharks. Okay, so on YouTube, if you have if you have a smart TV where you can access um, YouTube, just just search for the Coral City camera on YouTube, and, and it'll come right up. And if you want to, we have a whole community of people that uh, participate in the chat. So if you want to know what was that fish at twelve forty five thirty seven, really? they will they will answer those questions, or I will answer those questions. I'm underwater. I have to keep keep it clean. I'm underwater about once a week. Um, I've made about get to see you underwater? when I if you if you're lucky to catch me when I'm when I'm when I'm cleaning it it's about you know once once a week usually it's in the morning sometimes in the afternoon um, usually I let people know when I'm gonna when I'm gonna go there but I got to clean it with a toothbrush um, we've made collectively we've made over fifty thousand uh, observations of marine life that have been collectively done through a citizen science effort of the people watching the camera. Uh, and I've recorded most of those. So I've recorded close to 40,000 unique wildlife observations right off of the Coral City camera alone in the last four years, which when I add up all of that time is a huge amount of time. And, 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 and I hope that it can benefit uh, you know, some scientific research since it, it is such a, I don't, I don't think that any place on the planet has had this much um, monitoring in one place on a coral reef anywhere in the whole world. So this is, you know, we benefit, of course, because we're near the city and we were able to get electricity from the pilot's house and we're able to get onto the internet very easily. You know, to try to do this on the Great Barrier Reef would be very difficult because you don't have the, the technical connections that, that you need. So, you know, maybe 10 years in the future, we will have cameras like this all around the world in remote places uh, connecting people um, to places that they, they don't have easy access to. And I think that that's going to make the world smaller. And I think that that's going to make young people feel more connected and empowered uh, to, to protect the planet, um, which I think can really change the trajectory that we're on as a species and with our planet by, by sort of feeling like we're, we're all part of the same community, which is, which really, you know, we all live in the same fishbowl. We're all in the planet, we're all in this big, big blue planet. Uh, you know, it's a fishbowl for whales. Um, and, and we all share the same air and the same water. And um, you know this healthy appreciation for for nature and, and really some of the smallest organisms that are responsible for building our communities I think is 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 really great. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So that, you know, we, it's a good question. Um, and this is one of the paradoxes of, you know, these corals are living in places where humans probably might not want to go snorkeling because we have a lot of these swim advisories. And I've definitely been in the water um, with uh, questionable bubbles on the surface um, that you know, it's not always, um, it's not always so clean to be, to be swimming in this water. Um, and the fact that the corals are living in this soup 
of bacteria and nutrients is sort of defies the, the, our traditional understanding of what corals need. We think that, you know, very clean, clear water. And yet, you know, corals are animals and they feed on food. And one of the things that sort of all of the nutrients in the bay does produce the phytoplankton and the plankton that the fish are feeding on. And so there's, you know, there's a, a fine line between um, a healthy amount of phytoplankton in the water and, a, and, and crossing that line where we get these um, algae blooms and uh, fish die-offs. And so, you know, swimming in the water, it probably right now it, it's a, there's, we seem to have sewage leaks. Um, and sometimes they don't get noticed until we do the water sampling and we realize that there's a lot of bacteria in the water. And I, I don't know specifically right now what and where that um, that sewage might be coming from. The local one was very old. Yeah. Um, the local one here in Key Biscayne was likely caused from the wastewater treatment plant on Virginia Key. They had a power outage and caused the spillage. Um, but it's been lifted now. The water's safe again. But that's the recent one that was most likely the cause. Yes. Yes. Yes, so you can go to Coral City Camera. Sure, yeah, you can go for it. You can go to CoralCityCamera.com uh, or you can just go directly to YouTube and search for the Coral City Camera. So Coral City Camera, yeah, you can just go, go right to it. Um, yeah, let's, let's show them how to get there. But we have a laboratory in, in, in Alapata uh, that has over a thousand species of corals from around the world that are all very highly fluorescent. It's not really open to the public. Our dream is to build a coral museum here in Miami that will serve as an arc for the global biodiversity of corals where the public can see them and appreciate them like living art forms that they are uh, and, and also to serve to train the scientists in, in growing them, keeping them, um, and sort of having an arc. Go for yeah, that. I that's like the that. that's that's the big dream, yeah. and and really, you know, I mean, to, to his point about, there's two ways to motivate people, um, and one is through doom, right, and a lot of bad news, and we and and we only have so much capacity for bad news, um, and 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 sadly, sometimes bad news causes people to tune begin to tune things out because they already have enough responsibility on their plate, and I and I, what I like about the Coral City camera, like you mentioned, is that. It, it provides a it's a it's a glimmer of, of, of hope and optimism, um, that especially for young people because I think about kids and and their need to be inspired uh, and not feel like that they're hopeless or that, that that they've sort of been born too late on this planet, um, and and to connect them at a young age I think is um, you know a really Im important um, thing that we can we can plant those seeds right here in Miami because it's like how many kids live go to school where they have manatees in their backyard you know like Miami is a magical it is a magic city um, and 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 that we have we have this marine life here is something that we can't take for granted and that this is why people come to Miami and it's what makes Miami so special because you know we have sharks and manatees and sea turtles and and mangroves and 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 coral reefs and and beaches and and you know it's it, it's something that uh, you know it's important to kind of create those connections to in the young people as to why we are a, you know a tourism destination and it is the healthy ocean um, and if they make those connections like you described so well of you know growing up and being able to go snorkeling in Elliott Key and you know these are the things that 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 really can change our 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 appreciation of our sense of place and so you know I'd like to think that the Coral City camera can can do that to a certain degree uh, at a you know a very equitable level for everybody let me see so I think that, that um, let's see am I playing off of the off of the slideshow now or are we yeah, just this is the slideshow. okay I think that there's a couple more slides that yeah. oh, okay Sure. Oh, yeah. So this is this. This was just yesterday. Wow! Look at that. Oh, okay. These are all parrotfish. Oh. Did anybody see the parrotfish poop? No. So this is this is this is the, well. There's plenty. There's plenty of poop here because they're they're here for a, they're here for a while. I know. So so parrot parrotfish are some of the most important fish that we have on the coral reef because they're eating the algae. Uh, 
And when they and 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 since they're they they have they're called parrotfish because they have a beak, right? And they use that beak and they and they scour the rock. So what they're doing right here is they're cleaning. But when they they digest the algae and then they wind up pooping out clean sand. And so this is where our beaches come from. These guys. <laughs> and I've been traveling around the Caribbean, and you do not see populations of of parrotfish like we do here in Miami, which is which is remarkable. I mean, we have this is uh, we have rainbow parrotfish. We've got blue parrotfish, midnight parrotfish, striped parrotfish. This is a, a stoplight parrotfish. Um, all of the parrotfish here. This is this is a rare sight to see anywhere in the Caribbean. And the fact that we have it right here, you know, something again we really can't take they for make granted. A lot of noise. Yes, they, they, their teeth, you can, if we, had, if we had the microphone under the hydrophone, you'd hear them grinding. And yeah. also, this, they're doing this in a mob because, see, that's a damselfish. A damselfish, they are farmers, and they are very territorial because they grow the algae that they farm, and they eat that. And so then when one parrotfish comes through, the, the, the damselfish will chase them away. But damselfish can't really chase away a whole, a whole mob of parrotfish, and so this is their way of being able to get past the defenses of, of these really territorial damselfish that will it, we see we see these little damselfish uh, chasing after like snook like big 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 fish that they could totally completely eat they have no fear whatsoever um, but this is this is a special thing to see all of these herbivores here and that in no small part has to do with the fact that Florida really has pretty good wildlife and fisheries management um, you know where you can't eat parrotfish they're protected. Um, you know, we have size limits, we have bag limits, uh, you know, we see lobsters all the time in the morning. It's, it's remarkable that, you know, Miami is a place we're sandwiched between two national parks, that's remarkable. Um, and um, some of the, some of these um, are probably 16 to 18 inches long, probably 12 to 18 inches long. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, we have one that, that lives under the camera with it's called Cam Dam, and <laughs> and he pop, pops up because of course the, the fish want to come in and eat the algae off of the camera, and, and Cam Dam says says no. He he popped through earlier, but he'll you'll just see this little. It's not when it's right close to the camera, it looks like a big fish, but really it's only a couple inches long, right up next to the camera. Um, but this is you know this is a and this was yesterday, so you know it's um, mm hmm. They just hang. I mean, look. So this is the sand coming down here, um, and this is this is where this is where our, our beaches come from. They just look so happy. They're just they're smiling and they're goofy. Um, that's all they that's all they do all day long is they just they graze. Yes. Existing. I'm not sure. So, in the beginning of the presentation, yeah. what, what was it? Minimal existing condition. Minimal existing. It's a good question. Mm, we can we can go we can go back. Go all the way. Oh 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 okay oh, okay. yeah despite sure yeah let's go let's go take a look at the article yeah that one. So coral persistent despite marginal conditions in the Port of Miami. So marginal is how I guess scientists are describing this habitat. Marginal meaning really at the edge of the margin, the, the sort of the edge of possibility of where corals can live. So a marginal condition for the corals is, is you know, which is with, to say not really where you'd expect corals to live. So you know, marginal would be ter high turbidity. Um, you know, probably warm water because we have the, the low tide in the bay. Um, so it's marginal conditions for corals is kind of like the, the worst conditions that you, that you find corals because traditionally we think of corals living, you know, really clear water, very low nutrients. But now in recent years we've discovered that corals live in the mangroves. You know, they live along the edge of the shorelines in these kind of the margins of, of where you get corals. So you know why and how they're able to do that is what this research is is about, and we're you know looking at things from genetics to you know a coral doesn't have a, an immune system like uh, 
you know, they don't have uh, white blood cells. But what they have is they have a, a, a community of microbes and bacteria and fungi and viruses that live on them that sort of prevent the, the bad bacteria from causing them disease. And it's when conditions start getting out of whack, the, the temperature gets too warm, there's, there's a lot of nutrients that, dis, that disturbs the balance of, of this microbiome on the corals, um, which causes them to die. And so the, these corals living in kind of polluted, marginal, high, you know, a lot of extremes in temperature, um, you know, their microbiome is very interesting to scientists to understand, you know, how they're able to resist these diseases and bleaching here. They have a, they have a, correct. That's right. You know, and it could be because they're living in a soup of bacteria all of the, the, their whole lives, they've sort of, they have a very robust immune system because of it. How can they support the corals? Yes, so, you know, we, we of course, the Coral City Foundation uh, has a fund at the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Uh, if you'd like to support what, what we're doing uh, with the, through the Coral City Foundation, you're trying to get it into all of the local schools, trying to expand the reach, um, trying to expand the, the scientific um, potential of, of the camera and the research that we're doing. Um, so you, know, you can talk to, to Andrew. Uh, about that or, or myself, uh, but, but we're, we're very blessed and thankful for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation for providing us uh, with that fiscal sponsorship that allows us to take tax-deductible donations. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can, you can follow us and learn more. We have the social media uh, as well as just our, our websites, the coralmorphologic.com and coralcitycamera.com. And um, yeah. Course, and and sort of on the on the run out, you asked about where where we want to see more fluorescent corals. This is my, this is my lab in Alapata, so this is like a little four minute walkthrough of, of and most of these corals are not native to Miami. These are corals that come from Australia and from Indonesia and uh, Fiji and Palau and and all different places around the world. But we've got more than a thousand different species, and eventually this is what we want to be able to offer the public. But Well, this is, yeah, this is, of, of course, you know, we don't want to introduce any non-native species, you know, like species like lionfish. You know, when we see lionfish on camera, which we occasionally do, people react very, very we don't want that fish here um, because it's exactly. And that's the only time that they would like to see a spear fisherman is when we have the lionfish. Um, so, so, so making sure that we have the native species here is, is, is very important so as to not... Uh, introduce any non-native species, but at the same time, there's still a lot that we can learn from species of corals around the world in, in, in the lab and, and in closed systems. Um, so these are kind of, these are, these are 3D models of the Arsht uh, Center that we actually, we grew the soft corals on them and then we filmed them and then projected that back onto the, the Arsht Center last year. Um, wow. And these are all sort of these little glass cubes that are kind of, um, it's kind of the prototype of what you might see in a coral museum. You know, these sort of little vignettes, these little biotopes uh, of featuring different habitats and corals from around around the world um, in these small small boxes. Because oftentimes you go to public aquariums, and it's like the, they try to all have the biggest aquarium, um, which you yeah, and it's hard to really appreciate the little stuff in the big in the big tanks, or you're just watching the fish swim around that are coming up close to the glass. So you know, to be able to just see the coral in a very kind of contemplative, meditative way, I think is is a really important um, you know way to experience coral. And so this is sort of the behind the behind the scenes at the the coral morphologic lab uh, in 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 Alapata. Maybe maybe Andrew maybe Andrew can can organize a field a field trip maybe maybe that's something that we can that we can that we can that we can, we can talk about doing yeah yes so corals have the potential to live forever and that's really because they they, they clone themselves right there are, are there are a community of polyps that, that that clone so you can take fragments of those corals the same way you could you know plants the way you can take a cutting of a plant like a vine. Corals are the exact same way, and that's of course they, they, they do that in the wild. You know, there's a big there's a hurricane 
the waves, they break the coral into multiple pieces. And rather than killing the coral, each of those little fragments has a potential to reattach itself and start growing again. So corals, as long as humans are there to continue to propagate them, they, they potentially could live forever. Uh, at least the clones of them could. So it's, you know, corals are, are, are these real futuristic, uh, ancient futurists. <laughs> yes? Yeah, this is. Yeah, and so I just I just read I think that there was a, a an article published within the last week that had shown conclusively that the Gulf Stream has slowed down by four percent over the last four decades, and that it, the only explanation is what you described is the you know as the as the glaciers melt in Greenland, uh, it lowers the salinity. And this is, you know, when you if you look at if you look at the planet, and you look at the same latitude in Europe to where it is in Canada, you know, in, in Labrador, it's it's like an ice block in Canada, and yet in Europe it's warm, and it's kept warm because of the same exact Gulf Stream that keeps Miami warm. And so, if we didn't have that Gulf Stream, you know, the history of of, of Western Europe and Northern Europe would be probably completely different. It would have been frozen solid. You know, I like to think that it's the, you know, the fogs of London that sort of provided enough warmth to, for, for, for the Europeans to think their way out of the, the, the miserable winter to find their way to Miami, you know, Ponce de Leon, you know, all of the explorers, they, this is where they were, they were coming to. And it was actually Ben Franklin was the first person to correctly identify the, the, the Gulf Stream current. Um, because they realized that these boats could get back to, to Europe a lot faster than they could if they just got in the Gulf Stream. So Ben Franklin is responsible for a lot of things, and discovering the Gulf Stream is one of them. Everything is connected, and the planet's a lot smaller. I think if a coral had a slogan, it would be adapt or die, because it's cemented in place. It can't just pick up and move if conditions aren't to its liking. You know, And, ble and bleaching is a response to warmer temperatures, but a coral is oftentimes able to survive that bleaching and create a new association with a new microbiome that enables it to survive again in the future um, and to exist in warmer water temperatures. And I think that that's a, it's good advice for all of humanity, right? We have to be constantly adapting and changing um, because we are changing the conditions, uh, you know, and that, and that includes our technological lives, right? Like there's New, new types of technology we have to learn to use. You have to learn how to use YouTube and social media. Like these are things that we're constantly having to evolve and, and these, you know, evolution and it is sort of taking place at a faster and faster rate. But thank you, thank you all for having me. Wow. Pleasure to be here. Happy to, happy to speak with you afterwards.